Tang Xuanzong, passing through Zhou Lu, sighing as I pay homage to Confucius. So, Confucius, what did you achieve after all? Running around and wearing yourself out in those ancient days. Your land is now the Zhou clan's home. Your house was raised, rebuilt as a prince's palace. You lamented no phoenix appeared in your time, a time of troubles. You grieved when they caught the unicorn, your way declining. Now look at you. We toast you between two great pillars. Something you could only dream of in those bygone days. So we start a new section of the 300 Tang poems. All the poems that will come from now on will belong to the what we could call the modern style of poetry during the Tang dynasty. Until now we've been seeing styles that appeared before the Tang and that were cultivated sometimes with a slightly archaistic bend yeah, during the Tang dynasty. But the ones that come now, the regulated verse, Lushi, are a type of poem that was developed during the Tang. Uh, it's uh, basically a very, very formally demanding um, medium. Uh, I will explain some of, the, some of its characteristics in an independent recording further on. Basically, the regulated uh, poems um, present three basic colors, although in this anthology we will see a couple of unusual ones as well. So basically the Lushi, the normal Lushi is uh, eight lines and, uh, uh, the, and they, they can be five or seven uh, characters per line. This section that we're starting today is the pentasyllabic uh, regulated verse, the pentasyllabic uh, Lushi. We also have the quatrain or Chuechu, that's uh, just four, uh, four lines of poetry, half of uh, Alushi. And uh, there's another one which is not represented in this anthology, the, the Pailu, I think it's called, which is basically a reiteration, a combination of, um, of couplets or, or even of, of Lushi like uh, pieces uh, with a minimum of 20 lines and generally with multiples of 20. So, uh, the first poem in the five-word regulated verse is a poem by none other than an emperor, Tang Xuanzong. The brilliant emperor was the most important, arguably the most important, the most powerful, and arguably the most successful emperor of the whole Tang dynasty. If the Tang dynasty is generally considered a golden age in Chinese history, uh, the reign of Emperor Xuanzong is considered the golden age of the golden age, even if it had a, a tragic turn just at the end with the Anlushan Rebellion, which almost destroyed the dynasty, although not quite. It still managed to survive, even to partially recover its fortunes, and you know it survived uh, for about 150 years after the rebellion, although, as I say, in a weakened state and never mm, returning to its former glories. Tang Xuanzong, uh, Li Lungji, before becoming emperor, is a fascinating personality. We're not going to talk too much about him here. If you wish to learn more about him, you have lots of information on the net. He reached power through a coup. Uh, he was a member of the royal line and the sign on of the reigning emperor, but he had to participate in a coup to get rid of some uh, conspirators in the royal family that were trying to displace him. Uh, he presided over most of the, all of the first half of the 8th century as emperor. It was a time of splendor and peace, of successful military campaigns, of a very rich and cosmopolitan empire. Uh, the emperor himself was generally quite a competent ruler for most of his lifetime. He had a very long reign of almost 50 years. No, a bit more than 50 years, I think, actually. So half a century. And he was quite proficient in the arts, especially in music. He played the flute quite well. Like all members of the Tang elite, he would be able to compose a poem or so on occasion. And this is one of those poems that he composed on a visit to uh, the city of Lu and passing through 
uh, the native town of Confucius. Okay, so what is this uh, poem about? So it's a pretty straightforward poem. It's not very difficult or dark to understand or very symbolic. Emperor Xuanzong, for some region, so for some reason or other, which is not explained, is visiting the old territory of Lu. Remember, Confucianism has been uh, in the state religion of China since approximately the middle of the Western Han Dynasty, about 150 BC. Before that, it was a very relevant philosophical school. And uh, from 150 BC until the end of the imperial period in 1911, it will be the official. Uh, it will be the official religion. The, the official, uh, difficult to classify it as a religion, but at least the official state orthodoxy with different variations. So Confucius attained uh, an almost, well, not an almost, a completely sacral condition. There were temples to Confucius where he was worshipped. His descendants received uh, land grants, titles, hereditary titles. And, uh, you know, Confucianism until the end of the empire, mm, mm, you know, was canonical. And uh, for the examinations to become a civil servant, the main part of the corpus was uh, Confucian texts of the Confucian school, of the Confucian tradition. So it's only logical that an emperor passing through his hometown, perhaps on the way to somewhere else, or perhaps going on purpose, is uh, making a little bit of a poem to homage the sage, the sage of sages. So this poem is pretty straightforward. It just tells us uh, the reflections that come to the emperor's mind while he's visiting and sacrificing to Confucius in the ancestral temple. Uh, the topic, uh, mm, the figure of Confucius, commemorating the figure of Confucius, the hardships he had to experience, the, the dark times he lived in, and uh, there might be, I'm not sure about this, uh, because I don't know when this poem was written, but there might be some parallelism being painted between the emperor and uh, Confucius, if this poem was written after the al Lushan Rebellion, when the emperor had to abdicate and had to travel around parts of the empire to escape the rebels, now there might be a slight association also, um, or, or an intended association between the emperor and the sage. So uh, let's go to the poem bit by bit and couplet by couplet. This is a standard Lushi. Uh, we will explain characteristics of the Lushi later on, but uh, as I said in another video, but one of its main characteristics is the may is the the heavy use of parallelism. Uh, parallelism is uh, basically mandatory for a regulated poem in the second and third couplets, which must, in theory, exhibit perfect parallelism. Syntactic parallelism, that is to say, if you have a verb in the second place in the, in, in the first line of the couplet, you need to have a verb in the second place of the second line of the second couplet, or of the couplet. Uh, it's syntactic parallelism, but it's usually contrastive semantically. So, uh, for example, if the character is, a, is a, a character, a noun about light in the first, uh, in the first line of the couplet, there will be perhaps a a noun referring to not light but maybe sound or if the the first uh, the first uh, character in the first line is about uh, high things in the in the second line it will probably be about low things you know? so syntactic parallelism and uh, semantic contrast and we will be seeing this in the in the main in the in the lines to in the sec second and third couplet, as I said, so lines uh, one, two, three, four, and five, six. Although other lines could also exhibit parallelism, it was only mandatory in second and uh, third couplets. So, Confucius, what did you achieve after all, running around and wearing yourself out in those ancient days? So, the poem to Confucius starts with a rhetorical question. Uh, Confucius was not very successful during his lifetime. He served uh, his state of Lu in relatively minor positions at court. Probably he never reached the position of a vice minister of justice in his own state, as, as, as the legends and the later stories told. So he wasn't very successful in his own state. Uh, he, had, he was unsatisfied and wondered 
from country to country of ancient China, seeking a patron that would implement his philosophical and political program, and successfully. And the, the lack of success of Confucius is continuously expressed in this poem, contrasted with the great reverence and the mythical status that his thought and his figure would acquire in later times, including Emperor Xuanzong's own time. So we start with a rhetorical question. Was it worthwhile? Was it good for anything that you, O oh sage, had to wander years and years, running around, wearing yourself out in that remote time in the past? What did you achieve? Will the poem explain us if Confucius achieved anything? The first of the parallelistic couplets. Your land is now the Zhou clan's home. Your house was raised, rebuilt as a prince's palace. <clears throat> so even in the translation, some of the parallelism is evident. So house in the, in the third line, sorry, land in the third line, house in the fourth line. Zhou clan's home in the third line. Um, in the original, it would have been... Uh, Lu Prince's Palace in the second uh, in the second line of the couplet. So, what remains of Confucius in his homeland? Was he successful there? It seems not. The couplet seems to point to images of obliteration of Confucius's traces in his home state. It says your land is now the Zhou clan's home, so it's no longer the land of maybe Confucius' descendants, or even of the state of Lu in which Confucius lived. The state of Lu had long since ceased to exist, except as a feudal appanage that from time to time was given by the emperors to minor members of the imperial line, but no longer as an independent state. And not only the country has disappeared, your house was raised, rebuilt as a prince's palace. So Confucius's house has been destroyed. I'm not sure this is completely true. There is a story that, uh, I think in the Western hand, when a prince tried to demolish Confucius's house to expand his palace, mm, heavenly music was heard and uh, the, the prince, afraid, did not proceed with his demolition work. But maybe by the time of the Tang Dynasty, indeed, there was no longer uh, a house belonging to Confucius and standing. So anyway, both images seem to point to loss. The poet, star the poet started with a rhetorical question, asking about Confucius's presence and achievement in the presence. The first of the pluralistic couplets seems to answer in the negative. Your land, your home have disappeared. Second paralytic couplet. You lamented no phoenix appeared in your time, a time of troubles. You grieved when they caught the unicorn, your way declining. So again, the parallelism is very clear here. Lament, grieve, phoenix, unicorn, time of troubles, way declining. So it's you know, quite paralytic. If the previous paralytic couplet focused on the frustrate the, 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 the disappearance of the land and house of Confucius, the second paralytic couplet focuses on the disappointments and frustrations of Confucius himself through the mention of two mythical creatures. So in Chinese tradition, it was believed that a phoenix appeared to a sage uh, to give him good tidings. It was a, you know, a good omen for a sage like Confucius to see a phoenix. But Confucius did not see a phoenix because he lived in a time of chaos, a time of trouble. So he was not recognized and uh, was unsuccessful in his own time. You grieved when they caught the unicorn, your way declining. On the contrary, catching the unicorn, this is not exactly a unicorn, it's a Chinese animal, they called it mm, kiring or the chilin, which is more like uh, a, um, a mix of a rhinoceros and a giraffe <laughs> than, uh, than, than a unicorn. But it's a horn animal. So, on the contrary, the, the, the appearance of the killing or the chilling was an ominous omen. And, and it happened just before the death of Confucius. In one of the historical chronicles that talks about, among other things, Confucius' life, the Zhou Zhuan, it's one of the last entries. And when Confucius 
was informed that uh, uh, the unicorn had been caught. He knew that he was about to die very soon and that uh, his teachings were not, no, not going to continue in person. So not only now has the physical landscape of Confucius disappeared, in his own lifetime, his aspirations to become a sage or a sage advisor or perhaps even something more than that were frustrated and crushed and he died. So very dull, very, 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 very dim uh, perspective. But now we have the concluding couplet. And the concluding couplet gives us, gives a little twist to the situation because it takes us back to a present where Confucius is honored. His house might have been demolished. His land might be just a province of the empire now, an indistinct province among many, with people who were not related to Confucius in the land. He might have been unsuccessful in his own time, but now he has become the sage. He is worshipped in temples. His uh, words and principles are the law. And the emperor himself worships him. So now look at you. We toast you between two great pillars. Something you could only dream of in those bygone days. So... A couple of different readings are, can be made of this concluding couplet. There's the, the, the more optimistic one, which says, Look at how things have changed, Confucius. Now I am conducting, I, the emperor of this land, or the, or the retired emperor, I'm conducting a sacrifice in your honor between two great pillars of a temple dedicated to your memory. You could not have imagined that when you were, that when you were alive. You couldn't have imagined that you'd be worshipped and your teachings honored to the utmost extreme. So you could only dream with such a situation in your time. But there is another story uh, uh, that, uh, that was mentioned in the Chronicles. Just before that, Confucius dreamed that he, he saw himself between two pillars. And uh, this was an ominous dream, or, or at least predicting something not too pleasant for Confucius, because uh, coffins in mourning were placed between two pillars. So it was a sign that Confucius was about uh, to die. So Confucius did dream about being between two pillars, and that was a, an omen of his death. But perhaps that omen to his death is also connected, paradoxically, with uh, Emperor Xuanzang's uh, homage and uh, ritual to Confucius. So you dreamt about that. Perhaps you were dreaming about this as well, or, you know, they are connected. So, uh, not a bad poem altogether. Um, interesting poem in presenting the for the first and only time in this anthology an emperor mm, writing and uh, also interesting uh, because of a uh, reference to confucius i think it's also the first and probably the only poem in the anthology that you know directly talks about confucius about the sage so this as we said is the first of the five word regulated verse we will continue with another one tomorrow and very soon, maybe tomorrow as well, he will make a short video about uh, the Liu Shi, the regulated verse and its characteristics.